The generative models have showcased the impressive ability to create realistic samples from highly complex image classes. Now, so common examples are celebrity faces and bedrooms, but some recent results have been able to create generative models that can generate samples such as MRI scans, cells, and human fingerprints. So at this point, we're all quite familiar with what generative models can do in image generation, but today's talk is going to focus on how we can exploit them in image recovery problems and how they've already pushed forward the state of the art in theory and in practice. And so in today's talk, I want to discuss a bit about their empirics and a little bit about why they seem to be performing so well, and in particular, I'm going to try to argue that generative models provide lower dimensional priors that can be directly and efficiently exploited. And then I'm going to discuss how this has the potential to impact the imaging sciences and how experimental scientists can use deep learning and generative models to solve their own tasks. And so before I go into this point about their empirical success, I want to first discuss what exactly is an inverse problem. And so in an inverse problem, we want to recover an image x0 from some transformed version of it, which I call phi of x0. So here, phi of x0 are our measurements, and each entry of phi of x0 is a single measurement. And so some common examples of these inverse problems from image processing are denoising, inpainting, and super resolution, where you want to recover a clean image from a noisy version, a masked version, and a low resolution version. And so two important problems that are closely related that I'm going to be focusing on today are compressed sensing and phase retrieval. So compressed sensing, we want to recover an image x0 from its low dimensional linear projection. So you can think of phi as a fat matrix with fewer rows than columns. And so phase retrieval is a nonlinear version of this problem where we only get to see the absolute value of these linear measurements. And so how exactly we're going to use generative models to solve these problems, we're going to use what's called a generative prior. And so a prior is our previous knowledge about the image of interest that we can exploit to recover it with fewer measurements. And so under a generative prior, what we want to do is we want to find the image in the range of our generative model that best approximates our image of interest. And so when I talk about generative models, I'm going to be focusing on latent variable models such as VAEs and GANs. And so in order to utilize this approach, what you first need to do is train a generative model to output a certain image class. So these are images that your image of interest looks like. And then you want to find the image in its range that best fits your measurements. And so what you can do is you can directly optimize over the range of your generative model via empirical risk minimization. So I want you to notice a couple things about this objective function that you see here. So the first is that we're optimizing over the input to the generative model. And also, due to the nonlinearity of the generative model, this is going to be a non-convex optimization problem. And in addition, I stated it with a generic phi map here. So this formulation is actually quite versatile, allowing the use of a lot of different measurement modalities. And so just to give examples of where these types of generative models have provided state-of-the-art performance, so we talked about these previous um, common image uh, processing problems, denoising, inpainting, and super-resolution, but they've also shown great performance in compressed sensing. So for example, results from Bohr et al. from UT Austin show that you can actually recover images with five to 10 times less measurements than sparsity-based methods such as lasso. And in addition, Mardani et al. show that you can actually do MRI imaging uh, with the speed up of two orders of magnitude, utilizing GPUs and convolutional nets. Okay? So based on these empirics, we want to try to understand why these generative models tend to perform so well. I want to make the argument that it's due to the fact that they provide lower dimensional priors that can be directly and efficiently exploited. And so what exactly are we comparing them to? We're comparing them to sparsity-based models that use a sparsity prior. And what exactly do I mean by a sparsity prior? So natural images are nearly sparse with respect to a wavelet basis, meaning that in that basis, they can be approximated by something sparse. So as an example, you can consider the following two images here. So the image on the left is a photograph, while the image on the right was created by taking a wavelet transform of the image on the left, keeping only 10% of the largest wavelet coefficients. And as you can see here, there's still a high fidelity between the two images, even though the image on the right only has 10% of the wavelet coefficients. And so this notion of sparsity led to a lot of advancements in image recovery problems, in particular for the field of compressed sensing. So sparse compressed sensing led to a speed up of MRI imaging by a factor of 10 when it was first conceived and offers its own theoretical guarantees. But one issue with sparsity is that it may be too broad of a prior to actually exploit the low dimensionality of our data. So just as a thought experiment or a toy example of this, you can consider the following here. And so suppose we had an image class consisting of images of a single train, the same train, moving in a single direction. 
Okay? So all these images are of the same train moving in a single direction on this railroad. So there's really only one degree of freedom in this image class. So we could think of this image class as living on a one-dimensional manifold in natural image space. So here, the one-dimensional manifold is this line that you see here in red, and natural image space is this gray object, which is the natural image manifold. And so this single image lives on a particular point, but what sparsity-based methods will say is, well, this image is sparse with respect to a certain basis, but it wouldn't try to exploit any further information about how it relates to the image class. But what's the best way that we know how to approximate these low-dimensional manifolds was with the generative model. And so we can use deep learning and these generative models to actually exploit and understand the low-dimensional structure of our data. Okay, so in addition to having lower-dimensional representations, generative models also allow for direct optimization. And so just to draw a comparison, for sparsity-based methods, suppose you wanted to find the sparsest solution to a linear system of equations. So in this case, phi here is a matrix. And so what you could do is you could minimize the L0 norm subject to fitting your measurements. The L0 norm counts the number of non-zero entries in your vector. And so due to the computational intractability of the L0 norm, you can do a convex relaxation where you instead minimize the L1 norm, which is the convex surrogate for sparsity. Okay, so this is great when you have linear measurements. This may not, may not be possible with nonlinear measurements. And so what you can do with the generative model instead is you can directly optimize this optimization problem where phi can be linear or nonlinear. And also, when you're looking at this uh, convex surrogate formulation here, if you have nonlinear measurements, penalizing the L1 norm of your solution has shown to fail in certain problems, or appears to fail in certain problems. Now, that's going to be the focus of our attention today in the compressive phase retrieval problem. So in this problem, we want to recover an image x0 from some nonlinear measurements, which is the absolute value of linear measurement. And so here we have m nonlinear measurements, where each entry of the absolute value of a times x0 is a single measurement. And there's actually an open problem in the phase retrieval community, which is there is no known efficient algorithm to recover an s sparse signal from order s generic measurements. And by generic, I mean that the matrix A has IID Gaussian entries. And so there are some methods that provably cannot beat order s squared by direct L1 penalization. But what we show is that under a generative prior, you can actually get sample complexity that's linear in the latent code dimension. And so that's what brings us to our formulation of the problem, which is phase retrieval under a generative prior. So here, we have these nonlinear measurements, the absolute value of A times x0. We want to recover the image x0 by assuming it's the output of a generative model. So in order to recover the image, we can recover the original latent code corresponding to it, from which we can get the image back by just applying the generative model. And so we can do this by finding the best image in the range of the generative model that best fits our measurements by minimizing this empirical risk minimization problem. And so what we show is that actually this objective function has favorable geometry for gradient methods with sample complexity that's linear in the latent code dimension. And so what we show is that the objective function has a strict descent direction outside of neighborhoods of the minimizer and a negative multiple thereof with high probability, so long as the following assumptions are satisfied. So if the number of measurements are linear in K, the network layers are sufficiently expansive, so they grow in a certain way, and the measurement matrix A and the weights of our generative model have IID Gaussian entries. So if we take a step back and think about why the generative models perform so well, was well, that they have lower dimensional representations, so meaning that this K parameter can actually be lower than sparsity in some cases. And also, this can be directly exploited, so that's by the empirical risk minimization problem that we showed, which optimizes over the range of our generative model. It can also be efficiently exploited based on the fact that we can get sample complexity that's linear in the dimension of K as opposed to something quadratic. And there's actually exciting work being done at this conference by a group out of MIT, from Ma et al., that showed that a result like this can be shown with, in the linear case with actually convolutional layers as opposed to fully connected layers. And so we also looked at the case when we want to recover images um, from, uh, uh, images from the MNIST data set and so here are so just qualitative examples of recovery. And so we used a variational autoencoder, and we compared our method to three sparse phase retrieval algorithms. And we showed that with only 100 measurements, we can semantically nearly recover all the images, while the sparse phase retrieval methods are unable to do so. So now that we've discussed a bit about their empirical success, along with why they seem to be performing so well, I want to talk about how this has the potential to impact the imaging sciences and how we can provide a new workflow for experimental scientists. 
And so this new workflow really just involves three simple steps. So the first would be that you would create data sets of images that are relevant to your problem domain. So for example, for phase retrieval, this could be electron density maps, or this could be MRI scans. And then once your data set is trained, or sorry, once you've obtained this data set, then you can train a generative model to output these types of images. And then once you have this trained generative model, you can use it as a prior by collecting your measurements and then solving the optimization problem that we mentioned before. And there's actually already been work done in trying to create these types of data sets. And so here are just some examples of that. So the first image that you see on top is actually a screenshot from the Protein Databank website where it has thousands of images of these crystallographic structures that you see in X-ray crystallography. And in addition, NYU and Facebook just teamed up and made a new data set for MRI imaging. And so this is actually something that happened within the past week or so. So this is definitely a, an avenue of research that's gaining traction, and that's definitely important for work to come. And so just to reiterate some of the main points of the talk that we had today, were that generative models have provided state-of-the-art performance in these imaging inverse problems. And part of the reason for that is because that there are lower dimensional priors that can be directly and efficiently exploited. And we saw a specific case in point of that with the phase retrieval problem, where we can get sample complexity that's linear in K. In addition, we talked about how this could potentially provide a new framework for scientists and experimental imaging by utilizing these deep learning models and generative models. So I hope to see you later on at our poster after the session, and thank you for listening. Time for questions. So let me be, begin with one. Um, the, the, much of what you presented is, is experimental, uh, but when we look at sparse recovery, there is usually a lot of theory as to when can you recover the true signal. Can you comment as to whether uh, there are at least some specific cases for which you also can have some guarantees of recovery? So guarantees of recovery in terms of sparse recovery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of, for example, with compressed sensing, the um, problem that we mentioned here before, you can actually also guarantee recovery if you, in case you have a linear fee map here. You can actually guarantee recovery with order S measurements. Uh, in terms of um, our model that we showed here with the generative prior, so our formulation actually talks about the geometry of the objective function, but we haven't proven that we can actually get the signal yet. Mm -hmm. So we do give uh, an algorithm to actually try to recover the signal, but further work needs to be shown that this algorithm actually converges to the true signal that you're looking for. Now, if I understand your results guarantee the existence of a descent direction um, and uh, when you're far from the true signal. Mm -hmm. so. So what if the point at which you are at is not a differentiable point? So the, the, actually we give, a, um, we give a descent direction that has an explicit formula regardless of the point is differentiable or not. So what our theorem really guarantees is that at any point outside of these neighborhoods, there is a direction I can give you where you will have a point of lower objective value. So hopefully someone has a question at this point. So let's thank the speaker.